Everybody who knows his 1066 and all that knows that King John lost his jewels here in the wash. It's one of those things, like Alfred burning the cakes, King Canute ordering back the waves, Guy Fawkes trying to blow up Parliament, and Nelson saying, kiss me hardy. But what's so disheartening about so much of the history that everybody knows is that the Knowles so often say it never happened that way at all. King Alfred didn't burn the cakes. Nelson didn't say, kiss me hardy. Guy Fawkes didn't try to blow up Parliament. And of course, King John didn't lose his crown jewels here in the wash. If King John lost any treasure, it's more believable that he was robbed of it after the alleged disaster, six days later when he died at Newark. Died, so it's said, of a surfeit of fresh peaches and young cider, or was it lampreys? But if some of his baggage train was engulfed by a freak tide, freak tides do occasionally occur here in the wash. They call them stolen tides. They run about two hours earlier. Or alternatively, if his men were too precipitate in making the crossing or did it without a proper guide, then it's certain that the local inhabitants, who wouldn't have missed much anyhow, would have looted the wreckage on the next low tide. If they didn't, if the treasure is still here, silting could mean that by this time it's 60 feet down and irrecoverable. But all the cold water poured on the story by the historians hasn't deterred the treasure hunters. As late as the 30s, a company actually succeeded in losing 27 and a half thousand pounds without digging a hole. You'd have thought that had been the end of it. What hope of finding King John's lost property after 740 years in this flat waste of mud flats, creeks and washes? It's easy to believe that if King John tried to cross, his baggage train could have come to grief. But impossibly, two men, not cranks, but the sort of people who are only too anxious usually to destroy our cherished illusions of history, are now saying that they believe they've found the exact spot where King John's treasure is buried. Both are professors at Nottingham University, one of medieval history and one of geology. And the important thing is they've been working quite independently of each other. They say, that King John's treasure is lying here, under my feet. Yes, under a gooseberry bush. Professor James Holt is the historian. What's the historic evidence that John actually did cross the wash? Well, I think there's good evidence for this. Um, two uh, historians writing uh, within 10 years of uh, uh, this incident uh, describe it in considerable detail. Uh, another point is that uh, we know quite uh, definitely that uh, John crossed the wash on several occasions previously, once only three days beforehand and uh, once earlier in his reign in 1205. But how can you calculate where John crossed the wash? I mean, what's new in your researches? Uh, well, the most important part of my work has been uh, the part dealing with the king's itinerary. Now. Uh, the one of the most remarkable things about King John uh, is the incredible rapidity of his movements about the country. Uh, it's quite normal to find him travelling as much as uh, 30, perhaps even 40 miles a day. And uh, he could achieve these distances uh, with an army, with his household, uh, and uh, with a considerable baggage train. Now, uh, the interesting thing about the particular journey we are considering is that although he was in the middle of the Civil War and although he was uh, attempting to move north into Lincolnshire with considerable urgency, he didn't cover uh, this normal and uh, what we expected length of journey on the first day on which he set out from King's Lynn. But it's important to remember in considering this that the Wash in 1216 was not uh, like the uh, lie of the land as it is now. Uh, it was in fact very different and perhaps at this stage we ought to look at a map just to uh, uh, indicate what these differences were and to understand what precisely the problem was facing John on the day on which he tried to, uh, to cross. Now this is the present coastline of the Wash and this is the coastline as it was in King John's time. 
This poor estuary running up to Wisbeach here uh, carried the waters of almost all the main Fenland rivers. John's main problem was to cross this estuary. But there was a second problem of crossing a branch of the River Neen, which flowed into the estuary at Tidgoat here. This was a major hazard made worse by the fact that this area was still largely fen in King John's time. So I concluded that the likely causeway lay north of Tidgoat on the Lincolnshire side of the wash and probably started at Walpole on the Norfolk side. Now John left Kings Lynn early on the morning of the 11th and at his normal rate of progress, I would have expected him to have arrived in Spalding over 30 miles to the west by nightfall. In fact, he turned up at Wisbeach, only 12 miles from Kings Lynn, and as you can see, it's completely off the normal route across the wash. It's therefore reasonable to infer that he went there on this particular journey because something had gone wrong, not because he had deliberately chosen a different route from that followed by the baggage train. Well, assuming that part of the baggage train founded, um, the, the idea there was treasure in it is surely still supposition. Uh, Yes, uh, but I think strong uh, supposition, uh, at least for certain kinds uh, of treasure. I would imagine that the most likely thing to find uh, underneath the wash today uh, is a collection of uh, uh, 13th century silver uh, pennies. As John moved about the country, he c carried a considerable amount of cash with him uh, to meet his expenses and, of course, during the war, uh, to pay uh, mercenary uh, troops and uh, for the munitioning of castles uh, and so on. Now, uh, uh, that, of course, is not very dramatic for uh, modern treasure seekers. Uh, there may be treasure in other forms, crown jewels, crowns, uh, ceremonial swords, in short, the royal regalia. Now, there were two sets of regalia at this time, and uh, both uh, were called in from their repositories into the king's hands, one set in 1215 and the other set in March 1216. Now, that is the last we hear of the first set. Um, it vanishes from uh, history from 1215 onwards and uh, no part of it has ever been uh, discovered. It may have been lost in the wash. On the other hand, uh, it is quite possible that the king pawned it in order to meet the costs of war. This was the sort of thing which uh, uh, he, he was very likely uh, to do. Now, uh, the other set uh, partly survived, and some of it at least was used at the uh, second coronation of Henry III in 1220. Now the vital question. Uh, you say you've pinpointed the exact place where this treasure lies. Uh, no, I, I haven't quite pinpointed it. I simply uh, hazarded a guess as to the line of the causeway, and it was my colleague Professor Evans who actually pinpointed uh, a spot uh, under which uh, he thinks the treasure in fact lies today. Over to Professor Evans. I really didn't come here, you know, looking for buried treasure. Yes, That's the first one. I came here really because I was looking for a place where I could find marine sediments in estuaries in which I could study the rate of decay of marine organisms to oil, you see? So I was looking around for a place and the wash looked quite interesting. And then I found that a Dr. Tagg had done a lot of uh, scientific work trying to plot the causeway across which King John's treasure trove may have been taken, you see. And this seemed to be a good spot because if I could find that causeway, I would know the exact date of the sediments associated with it. And this would give me my first essential point. Then at the same time, I began to hear of the work of my colleague, Professor Holt, who was a great authority in King John, and he'd been working on this problem of the missing treasure too. So the two things added together made it a very exciting idea to come here, to drill rather than somewhere else. So that's why I came here. Now, the first drilling, of course, was the most crucial thing, and so I had to bring all kinds of scientific ev evidence together, like using magnets and so on. So it was a lot of preliminary work. And then, of course, the Air Ministry provides air cover for most of Britain, and air photographs are the best things you can possibly use. Now, I've got one here, and I think if you come and have a look at this with me, you will see that this air photograph actually shows the position of the causeway running through here. Well, you see it perhaps a bit better if I put this overlay on, where I've oh, marked yes, it yeah. on, you see? Here's the causeway coming through here, joined by another one. It comes down here, and it gets a little difficult to follow, brings you down through here, then across the old well stream which runs down here, and so on. 
But um, why does the, um, the causeway show on the air map? Well, yes, now you see you've got 15 feet of modern deposits on here. And through these deposits, uh, water is migrating upwards. Now, the water will migrate differentially from the mud flats, which the causeway really consisted of, and the wet sand on either side. So it shows through, you see, as a difference of soil effect at the surface. These are the remarkable things about air photographs. We use them all the time for this purpose. So now we come, you see, down here. And you see the causeway comes down here. And I thought, well, now, looking at this historical evidence, it would seem to me that where it was difficult to find the causeway would be exactly where Professor Holt's accident could take place. This, of course, you added a lot of excitement for me and my students, and we were going to do this drilling anyway in a kind of amateur sign of sort of way. So we needed experience, you see. So the hole went down. First 15 feet went through the deposits and been built up to form this dry land, you see. Ordinary shales, muds, and so on. And uh, then, slap into the quicksand. Now, this was a real problem because the quicksand, you see, is difficult stuff to deal with. It's like drilling into a plate of soup. Every time you pull the drill up, the hole filled in. More than that, of course, the sand started to come up after us, too, and this caused a problem. However, we went down. We got tremendous experience from that first hole. Then we went here now to prove the other side of the causeway. Then we put a number of holes along here to prove the causeway itself, and this we proved without any doubt at all. Now, this then brought us then to back now. We'd got all our oil information from our other borings, and, I, and the, all, all the chaps said, oh, look, Prof, we must do something about this here treasure, you see. So we put our heads together, and we said, right, the probability is here's the old well stream breaking the mud flats up. Probability is this is where they got stuck. And this is what Professor Holt says. See, they got stuck in here, lost their treasure, came back then and went down to Wisbeach for the night. So that was what we did. We drilled there. Now, to go down, we had to invent a special sort of pipe. And we've got, got it here. You see this sort of pipe here. And uh, it consists of a quarter-inch steel pipe, you see, quite sturdy. And the specimen goes down through there. Yeah. It's going down to the ground like that, you see, rotating yeah, all yeah, the time yeah. on its own head. Well, in this particular hole, it was going down and down in its own head like that. And then we pull the specimen out like yeah. so, you see. Down and down and down it went. Well, I wasn't here this particular day. But they phoned me up dramatically to say, we've hit something, you see. So I said, hold it. And we came down and had a look at it. We pulled the pipe up like that, put a big polythene bag underneath and washed it all out. And then this is what we found. We found, you see, that this bit, which normally has two long teeth like that, you see, curved in, had been completely shorn off. Not only that, you will see that it's all twisted and broken. So it's obviously it hit something pretty hard. Well, well, rock. Well, you couldn't call it, you couldn't expect it to be rock, you see, unless somebody had thrown it in. You see, in quicksand, you wouldn't have anything in it unless somebody had tumbled it in or, or it had got tumbled in off the causeway. But we found no rock in this. So we thought it might have been something that caught it like that and, and it yeah. got twisted and bent like that, you see. As you can imagine, we were very excited, of course, yeah. and we took all this stuff back to Nottingham passed it through sieves, examined it under the microscope, and so on. These are some of the things we found. Now, just have a look at that. Those are some nails, you see? Rather primitive-looking nails, scales of uh, iron and so on, and uh, could easily have come off a box or a cart or something like that. Pretty exciting, you see? Then there are these uh, bits of scales of metal again. Could have come off swords and things, and these little knobs of steel. See, there were a lot of swords down there. Among them, for example, there was this sword of Tristram which is about as famous as Excalibur. And a lot of odds and ends like that, you see, down there. And then we come to bits of oddments of iron and so on, all of them artifacts. They must have come off things, you know, objects of some kind that, that got into these sands. And then, of course, the real discovery, of course, was when we got these little bits of gold. Look at that. You see, a bit of gold, well, I'm a bit blessed. of silver. See? Could it have been a, a sporting gun? I mean, a lot of fowlers have lost their guns here in the wash. Well, it, no, no, I, I don't think I'll let you have that because, you see, this is 15 feet down. The whole, we picked this lot up at about 25 to 28 feet down. So you're in deposits that were laid down in the 12th, 13th century. I grant you. <laughs> All right. So, so this is uh, stuff that's really tipped in. You don't expect to find anything in these sands unless it's tipped in. You see, this is really accidental material in the sands. So this is uh, the first uh, example of any precious metal that's ever been found relating to this problem. And so related to the causeway, I, it's a reasonable guess that it might be connected with, with this King John disaster. Well, it's 
very exciting. What, what are you going to do next? Well, this is a big problem, of course, really, isn't it? I mean, who's going to take the responsibility on finds like this, of putting, putting down a deep excavation? Borings won't find it. You'd have to dig a big hole. So you've got to go through 15 feet of this made ground first. Then you go into the quicksand, and this is the dangerous bit of the whole thing. Mark you, people have been very generous and made great offers. We could chemically consolidate the quicksand, of course, but the great danger is that if we go down with a big hole here, we're going to upset the water table. And if we upset the water table to such an extent that the salt water seeps up to these very luxuriant orchards, then, of course, you've really got to buy the whole farm, haven't you? I'm not a treasure seeker, but it's great fun.